Welcome to yet another episode of Contact Lost, the Polish English speaking podcast about Warhammer 40k, competitive Warhammer 40k. Um, and with me today, I have uh, the amazing, the one and only Ines Wilson, one of the best players in the world right now, definitely one of the best players in the UK. Soon we will find out if one of the best in the world, because as far as I know, he's going to Atlanta. Ines, uh, are you going to win this? <laughs> I am not playing Eldar, so probably not, but I'm going to do as well as I can given the circumstances. I'm playing two events in the States. My combined record in the States so far is uh, 10 and 2, so I'm hoping to, hoping to get that, hoping to, to take that loss off the table this time and manage, a, manage an 8 and 0 and then an 8 and 0. That's the goal. Um, but it should be interesting either way. I mean, the, the, the tournament, from, from, from what I hear, to, to those who might not know what Atlanta is and what's going on there, this is the creme de la creme of like singles. So uh, you, we will have players from all over the world or <laughs> the part of the world that actually plays 40K and matters. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's going to be a, 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 a tough tournament from what I hear because there are going to be British players, there are going to be Polish players, there are going to be Belgian, French players, players from all over the world who won a golden ticket at one of the events. So no weak players to be well i mean there's always a chance you can play against one of the polish people or one of the americans or something like that and just like they're not singles players they'll be fine you'll be you'll be fine right uh, love you really last you um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, i think skark is going as well uh, yeah and uh, i look forward to seeing hopefully just eight people see the light just see the light die in their eyes as skark just rolls over them while saying just pointing and saying off it's going to be glorious. Yeah, I hope, yeah. I hope, uh, I hope many people that aren't me have that experience. I hope there is good coverage of that, and I hope uh, like they put him on stream so people in the world can see how oh, it's done. It would be, so, be so good. They, they <sighs> right. run the entire game as well as the part of the table did, because it would all be through sign language. It's incredible. Yeah, that's one thing. And then he's going to pull off something stupid, like do homewares with... I don't know what else can do homewares, because apparently Basilisks cannot do it anymore. Uh, but I'm sure he can pull something. it off with, like... He'll pull it off with, like, a single, like, mortar from, like, his command squad that ran there didn't even like come back it'll just like have made it all the way up and he'll plant a flag for five points on the last yeah he he is capable of that but yeah so so this is the caliber of players that we're going to see in atlanta you included to anyone who has been hiding under a rock or for some obscure reason you don't know who Innes is in is as i said is one of the top players in the uk uh he has his own coaching service he runs stat check where along with 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 a bunch of other amazing beautiful people um Plays for Team Scotland as well, so that like, and 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 is just overall a very, what's the word? Titled player? Can, is that the word? Can you say titled? Titled, titled is one. Um, prolific, maybe or um, notorious, well recognized, frequent, I guess. just around everywhere. What are, something like that? I don't know. Yeah. It's okay. So to, one of them. It's difficult to pin down an, an exact word for what level of the level of and like barnacle on the community. I don't know. There's, there's lots of. <laughs> Definitely a staple of the community uh, and, and someone, a force to be reckoned with. I, I guess this is the, the best way to put it. <laughs> so um, today, I mean, I've, I've mentioned stat check, I've mentioned all those things. So there will be time at the end of the episode to plug this as well. Uh, this is the first part of a two-part episode that we're going to do. Uh, in the first part, we're going to focus on the Codex Tyranids versus Codex Space Marines comparison. So we are going to, I have a bunch of... Um, sides from which we are going to approach those books and then i'm going to 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 pick Innes's brain um and 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 tap into his expertise to sort of rate how the books are doing and how how viable they are from from different angles so this is part one and in part two this is going to be available for our patrons and then we will release it after some time while it is still valid uh, to, to people who are not our patrons, but do consider becoming a patron. Uh, we'll link that in the description uh, to have early access to the masterclass because this is going to be a Tyranid masterclass. So uh, we have a list ready. We are going to, to, to talk about that, how that list was built, how it's going to be used, um, you know, what, what, what potential missions it could take and so on and so what, what, what are the Tyranids good at? What do they suck at? How to mitigate that? So yeah, plenty of interesting stuff. So. Uh, do give it some consideration whether becoming a patron is a good idea. Uh, it helps us greatly to grow, and you can get some fantastic merchandise from us. But enough of the introduction. Uh, so, in this, we, we, we are comparing the two books. One came out a little bit earlier, the second one a bit later, still fresh. We could say players have had access to it for some time. I myself have even been able to play against some lists built based on the new book, even the book 
I don't know, is it officially out yet? The book or... came out on, just came out this past Saturday, the 14th. I played a right. little RTT with it on Sunday and got a good feel for some of the stuff from the new book. It's been right. a So it's it's Thursday the 19th today, for those who, who might be catching up with us a little bit later. So uh, so I've played against this like two weeks ago already, uh, some some Dreadnought spam and so on. So, so this was, definitely people had access to it before and... Uh, and, well, and we had I, once we had all the Goonhammer content. It was out. It was out much. like we had all the data sheets already. So it was just if you had the stratagems and the detachments, you could basically go nuts once they mm. printed, once they previewed the new points, and you could have played with the old points and not been too far off. So it was pretty exactly. easy to get. We've basically had the book in hand for two weeks now, and then three weeks if you were willing to play with the old points, which has been pretty fine. Yep, and all the TTS leagues that 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 are out there, so Copenhagen, Try Hard, and so on, all of them basically have players who play Space Marines, and uh, even though they submitted like all their lists when the league leagues started, at least uh, I didn't have a problem with the players that I played against for them to use the new points, the new lists, and so oh, on. Yeah, so I yeah, so I hundred percent let any Marine player yeah. swap over to not having good oath of moment <laughs> midway through a league anytime, any day exactly. of the week. Hundred percent, exactly. Please, please swap. I would love it. <laughs> that was like tactical. Um, yeah, so so we are comparing that new Space Marine book to the Tyranids book, and I'll start with like a very simple introductory question that is or demands a subjective answer. Um, let's start with rating the books in terms of sheer fun that they give you. I, that's probably the easiest to tap into. So you are, among others, a Tyranid player. You are a Space Marines player. Uh, having had both of those books in your hands, having seen the unit variety, having seen um, how they played the missions, um, and so on and so on, which one do you consider simply more fun? That's a really tough question because both of the books, there, there's a very weird thing at the moment as we're coming to the codex is that we're, we're coming off the indexes, which have more or less almost all of everything that's in there unit wise right so we're very we're not seeing a ton of like new unit dimensionality we're more adding detachments which you know give you new strategies new ways to use those same units but at the core it's all still based on the same things that we've been using for you know since july this year right mm -hmm. so it's very difficult to say based on that because i think of the two and i mean if we're sticking to just the marine codex and not including any of the supplements on top of that which i think is probably the fair thing to do in this case i think the Terranids book is generally more interesting it has a lot more tools at its disposal even if some of them are you know really sad like anything that resembles a melee profile in that book um it does have a lot more tricks and trades and like things you can do to try and you know um, outplay and outsmart your opponent whereas the marine codex especially when you don't include any of the supplement units really does feel quite one-dimensional um there's a very very set core of units that are playable and then there is a little bit of adjustment to that depending on what detachment you're playing but it very much feels like the core set of things that is good is in space marine codex especially is the things that are good and there is not a ton of depth outside that um before you could kind of and i think the marine codex killed some of that variety that we had in the index even because you had things like oath of moment that while it was a very binary mechanic right like it was pick a thing it dies this turn mm -hmm. there was a lot of ways that you could use that to allow units that maybe wouldn't like weren't really efficient enough but did something interesting that you you could build your list around so we saw stuff like olivia weiss from the french team playing shrike and 10 vanguard veterans at mm -hmm. um, lgt because that unit with all the moment could kill a lot of things because you had lethal hits into full rerolls with lone operative and all that kind of stuff and then you take that away that unit's a bunch of strength five attacks that you know just clutching on lethal hits but i don't know if you've played lethal hits with four heroes they're not the most reliable thing in the world they are not um things like terminator squads that are you know pretty bad at hitting and are you know strength eight which is you know reasonable but isn't really killing vehicles suddenly lose you know 30 percent of their damage output 50 percent of the damage i put into depending on the target there's a lot of ways that the things that you could kind of do to solve the like the dynamic problem of marines it kind of went away then on top of that they lost a lot of scoring units so things like land speeders and scouts uh scout sniper squads which were a lot of the way that you you know interacted with the gameplay because marine units are at their core fairly expensive um you don't have anything like the cheap 75 point scout sniper squads or the land speeders to just go and do a thing in a corner or just stand a place you kind of you know you get forced into playing very very dull units now like intercessor squads that are just worse than pretty much anything else you could run at that point slot or specifically the regular scouts are still there and they went down 10 points and they're still good but they are mm -hmm. they're a very different unit to like 
they don't move as fast as a land speeder they don't have lone operative like scout snipers did so a lot of the like build diversity got pulled out of the marine codex and then kind of added back in with attachments but in a way that i don't think is the most interesting whereas mm -hmm. the nids codex has a lot of the nids codex brought in a bunch of units which was great we've got the norn emissary now the neurolictor which was a massive up and the neurolictor is the best unit in that codex um deathly pursuing an update like just like, a lot of little things that just kind of added some options to nids and then their detachments are a lot more a lot more foundational rewrites right where mm -hmm. the things that work in tyranids work because of the detachment except like there's a little bit of invasion fleet and synaptic nexus if you want to play the white bread right you can play the generic stuff and they're both pretty strong and they use all the same data sheets and you just kind of like take your poison on which way you want to go but assimilation swarm invade um synap the swarming masses i think it's called and mm -hmm. vanguard onslaught um all do something very very different um and give you and then crusher stampede exists um they all do something very different. They encourage you to play a list in a very different way to like the rest of the thing. And the Marines has that as well, right? Like it has um Vanguard Spearhead, which gives you the stealth and lore stealth and all that. It has the um advancing charge from Stormlands, it has the Iron Storm, which makes your whirlwinds really better. Um, like they do encourage you to play different things, but because the unit pool for Marines is so kind of binary, it kind of changes like what's your 600 points of flex slot going to be for your detachment and then you put that in or you go mm -hmm. for like an all-in skew list there's not really any like hey i just want to play this kind of thing you know there's no detachment that makes core codex space marine melee work like there just is you cannot do that yeah. there's another thing you can play um whereas nids you can kind of you know if you really want to play heavy melee we saw a guy play uh 18 when ryan's leapers and 18 um <laughs> raveners go uh seven and one at tampa um We've seen, you know, double Nord Emissary lists doing at least okay. Like, I don't think it's the most interesting in the world. But, like, there's a lot of things in that book that just, because of the way turreted units work, where you have everything, you have the big monsters, the little bugs, the small bugs, which all kind of necessitate their own demands on list building and their own strains and their own, like, things that they want to be supported by. Uh, it's very different from what's your flavor of slow, of, like, marine tank shooting and mm -hmm. marine infantry scoring and maybe marine infantry damage, right? Like, you're kind of picking your, picking between, like, very similar things there, and there's not a lot of, like, the detachments, especially in the core marines, like, once you start adding in, like, Death Company or um, Deathwing Knights or a bunch of other things like that, there are, there is still dynamism in that, co in that codex, but it doesn't come from the core marine codex, and the, I think for that reason, the core marine codex itself is not a good book. I, I do not like it very much, frankly. So if we were, you know, let, let's keep this on a fairly high level. Uh, I mean, you, you you touched upon many things that I want to tap into in a moment, but let's leave it on this high level uh, as you summarized it now. So in terms of fun, in terms of sheer subjective, how much joy you draw from, from putting the nids on the table and putting Space Marines on the table, uh, how would you rate it from 1 to 10, both both the books? Okay. How would you rate it? Um... Marines is a 10 the first time you roll a Whirlwind with Mercy's Weakness and Oath at the moment, and a 3 mm. at every other step of the tournament. And Nids is like a constant 6 or 7. Like, mm -hmm. they're both... Like, I don't think either of them are, like, smash it out the park incredible codexes within the environment we're playing right now. And I think that's part of it, is that some of the indexes are just wildly, wildly differently tuned to each other in the way that they approach playing the game and being fun. That I think mm -hmm. Nids would be... I keep describing this as an in six months codex, where in six months' time, this is going to be great because it's going to feel like it does stuff because everything else will have been toned down to its level. But right now, it's like a seven because you it feels like that book works really hard to do anything resembling damage, and that isn't the most enjoyable thing in the world. It just kind of... Every game feels a little bit slow and grindy. Um, and Marines is just... The Marine Car Park build that I think that book encourages you to play is just boring. And yeah. that I have a problem with that personally. That's not the reason I come to a tournament to try and play Warhammer. I'll do it, but I won't. I won't pretend I'm going to have fun while doing it. Mm. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll use this this opportunity before we jump to the next question to also mention that we are doing the uh, the, the Codex comparison and then the Master Class with Innis. Uh, and then I know that Joker has planned to do the uh, Space Marine Master Class with Leshu. And Leshu is part of the of, of Team Poland. He is actually the guy who create, I, I guess, either created or popularized the Land Raider Redeemer with aggressors, with biologists, and so on archetype. And the Deathwing Knights, yeah. And I get Death all the credit Knights. for the Deathwing Knights. I 100% solo from Leshu. Uh, 100%. There you go. <laughs> there we go. So we will have the guy responsible for what you're seeing on the tables right now pretty much everywhere, uh, talking about Codex Space Marines. So uh, yeah, also tune in for that. And uh, and again, consider becoming a patron because that is going to be uh, on early access available to our patrons uh, before there is another data slate and uh, probably changes everything in uh, december everything. You, you got two months to get some patrons yeah that, exactly so 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 there is still time but yeah 
Uh, just putting it out there. Anyway, um, second question. So we have our, our initial rating for the fun. Now, both armies, so Tyranids and Space Marines, it is no coincidence that they already have the books because they are the, the starter set armies. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the starter set, uh, you could think that GW is trying to attract people, new people to the hobby. Usually the idea is that you buy the starter set and split it with a friend, for example, and it could be a starting army uh, something that you th then build upon and so on. So let's look at those books and those armies uh, through the lens of a beginner. How would you rate those armies and those books uh, when we consider how beginner friendly they are? As so, far as like building an army from the Leviathan box? No, like just, I mean, I mean, starting with the Leviathan box, but then developing the army learning the army rules the complexity of the book actually like are, which which of those armies is more difficult to play um are those armies overall beginner friendly or not so much so i think space marines kind of always is a little at least a little bit beginner friendly it has the the you have a decent armor save you're fairly receptive to like making you know like having a mistake and like getting bailed out by the fact that you're running two and three farmer saves across the board and you have you know big things like the blister strike not in the leviathan star set that's pretty reasonable to come out of uh Stargard veterans i think before the codex i would have said were fantastic and now they're like middling um i don't think the like the flame memories that you get are terrible to build off of and then you get like terminators which are you know at least fine like in sort of like mm. beginner games and sort of like if you're playing like thousand point games with your friends like a terminator squad is a big threat super cool to build off of and like excuse me i wouldn't be like super upset to see one like at a tournament level at 2k like i would maybe question why you were running them but i wouldn't be like i can't i have to ignore these uh, or i can ignore these like there's still a, a unit that like is involved they definitely so like the marines codex like if you're building off of the leviathan starter like springboard the apothecary biologist being in that set encourages you to move towards like aggressors or eradicators which is already a unit which is a unit that's pretty good and like there's a little bit of like flexion there and then you have things like oath of moment and armor of contempt and um like all these kind of like get out of jail free mechanics almost in space marines that yeah generally i think you put marines on the table and as long as you're playing against like people who are playing similarly power leveled lists marines are not overly complicated and you'll have a I'm gonna lose. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm just playing with the, with the settings to check with the camera, um, which camera is better mm -hmm. continue uh, marines uh definitely gives you like a lot of flexibility in kind of like that environment nids on the other hand for one thing the units in the starter set are not a great translation to like uh like an, an army the neuro tyrant is like a very playable unit the barb gaunts are okay um the screamer killer kind of sucks it's like one of the worst point of monsters in that codex. Price especially yeah the psychophage is a support unit not really a monster like it's, i get that it's a big bug in starter set it feels like it should be good but you know it's it's not it's a it's a support unit with a feel no pain or it's not really a damage dealer um and then you've got a horde of gaunts and some rippers like the rippers are great don't get me wrong 20 points for a ripper put that in your list you'll have a great time scoring your deploy talent homers but in general the nids playstyle is a lot more finessey because the army doesn't really do damage outside of specific units none of which you get in that starter set you're looking at things like exocrines maliceptors um trigons um zone throats all the kind of stuff that like none of that's in the starter set and the that kind of set doesn't encourage you in that direction very hard it's kind of like hey here's a bunch of melee and you might be encouraged to go towards like a turvagon or something like that to support the 40 gaunts that you get or the 20 gaunts that you get 40 if you've got two sets you might look towards like warriors to go with the winged prime to give us something to do like maybe gargoyles like there's lots of things that that are but none of that takes you in the direction of a list that's easy to play you mm. could definitely end up with like a fairly interesting like vanguard invasion like you know six one ryan's leapers and 20 gargoyles and six and 40 gaunts and a neuro tire to support it and so and like that list will be great if you really know what you're doing and you're okay with winning a game without dealing damage but as a beginner that's not that's not a play style i would ever recommend so i would give like marines like a solid eight and turn it's like a two on that it's mm -hmm. it's just not a play style that that encourages and i think and then the last thing is if you're playing star set games against each other the, the boxes are just wildly imbalanced um the plus right not will rip through everything in that in the marines list without problem and there's also terminators that don't really die as long as they don't go near the screamer killer yep um and i think that that's also a terrible that's also not great but also probably not how the boxes are balanced like i don't think anybody really cares how balanced the game is when you're playing at that points level um but yeah in general i think on that sense nids are a mess but marines is fine right marines is marines is always fairly simple to play yeah, but GW did a, a, a good job packing as much of new stuff as possible into oh, for sure. a box set. 
Uh, so, so yeah, so so I will one one last thing on that as well. Actually, mm -hmm. um, the only thing I will say there though, the Nids detachment, like the invasion fleet from the index, is way simpler than Gladius. Gladius is a complicated detachment with a bunch of once per games and like overlapping buffs and things like that. That is like definitely would knock that down a couple of pegs if you're just going to go with like playing with the index. But if you're playing like any, then uh, there's definitely something there that are a little more dynamic. And Nids has like invasion fleet is fine, right? So like. I would say, like, if you were just going Gladius and Invasion Fleet, that probably, like, adds a point and takes a point away from respectively, so you end up with, like, a 3 and a 7 again, as opposed to, like, a 2 and an 8. But mm. not, really a, not really a big deal. All right. Okay, cool. Uh, so, next question that I have, again, maybe the order of those should be changed a little bit, but what the hell? Uh, <laughs> I make the decisions. Uh, so, we have, uh, the next question is about the variety in terms of detachments. So, both books introduce certain concepts through detachments that essentially are supposed to introduce different play styles uh, or at least that's how i how i perceive it like i, I have the tyranids book in my hand and if i look at those you you have a detachment for the big bugs a detachment for the small bugs a detachment for har harvesters and like uh, you know uh, stuff that eats matter for, and, and that's for rippers apparently yeah it was for interesting bringing story. back stuff and rippers uh and then you know uh advance and charge and then around brain bugs i guess so generic a, yeah a gener <laughs> yeah but, but on paper this sounds like at least gw is trying to introduce variety i don't know that much about space marines i i mean how i would understand if they had you know, one detachment for Space Wolves, one for Dark Angels, one for Blood Angels, so and so that's on. that's kind of what they did, right? So mm -hmm. I'll quickly run through how the Marines ones did it, just for yeah. like for the benefit of the conversation going forward. So mm -hmm. Marines, there are six detachments, five of which are based around the first are based around first finding chapters, and then one of which is based around like the first company stuff. So they have um, the first company task force, which is based around uh, you once per game get old oath a moment back, and it buffs Terminators and Stern Guard and Play Guard and all that kind of thing. You have the Gladius, which is the Ultramarines based one. Uh, which is all around flexibility and score and like um being able to buff units up once per game win situations and flex tactical flexibility fall back and shoot fall back and charge all that kind of stuff um you have vanguard spearhead very different to vanguard onslaught don't forget that because vanguard onslaught's the advanced charge one and spearhead is not um so vanguard spearhead is all about tricky shenanigans you can like mine objectives and you get um like all raven guard stealth so if you're outside 12 you get stealth and stuff like that it's got like the track the um like loan operative for enhancement and things like that then you have the space Wolves, the um white scars attachment which is Stormlance, uh which is all about mounted units so everything gets advanced charge but and then there's a bunch of buffs specifically to mounted units but mostly they're there's either either buffs for mounted units or buffs that are better on mounted units tends to be the way it goes so you'll have like a plus one to charge but if you're mounted you also get reroll charges and things like that i think mm -hmm. that's one of them and then you have like uh, a minus one to hit and wound stratagem for, for bikes and things like that and that detachment's all about encouraging you to go fast and hit things which is not a thing the core marine codex is very good at so you'll never see it played as white scars but it, that's what it's for uh there's the imperial fist attachment which is anvil strike force that's all about um basically about being still which is a really weird way to interact with skills like the guard army uh where every gun in your army gets heavy and then if you already had heavy you get plus one to wound when you stand still instead and then it has a bunch of strategies about like never moving backwards and doubling your oc if you don't move and things like that about like being stationary and then hitting from far away and killing buildings and things like that uh and then you have the iron sword spearhead which is iron hands uh that one's all about buffing vehicles and very specifically uh, you have things like lethal hits or for vehicles you have um rerolls for hit wound or damage so like kind of like the other one with a little less flexible a little more flexibility but a little less raw rerolls um you have like buffing dreadnought stratagems all explosions for vehicles um a lot of stratagems that are good on vehicles but better if you use them, better good on units but better if you use them on vehicles specifically and that attachment's very much around like the dreadnoughts and vehicles and all that kind of thing and a bit of resilience in there and then you have the last one which is the salamanders one which is firestorm something i don't know first or assault some assault force i the, the second fire, words sir. don't exist something about right? fire the salamanders attachment and that one's all about um getting up in your opponent's face with like short range weapons so you get assault on all your on all your guns and plus one strength if you're within 12 and that one's all about um flamer weapons and transports so it's a lot of things like um getting back into a transport getting out of a transport when it gets shot shooting your opponent when they're closer getting out of transport and getting plus one to hit just mm -hmm. lots of like little ways to interact with that and then the common thread through all of them is armor contempt so there's a one, one cp Minus one to the AP of your opponent's weapons is the common strategy through all of them, and they have five extra on top of that. So it's very, there's definitely a lot of different directions that that kind of set of things wants to pull you, right? There's an advance and charge one, there's an advance and shoot one, there's 
um, buff everything, but only sometimes. There's um, stand still, basically. Stand still. Yeah. There's stand far away. You know, lots of like different approaches to that. Uh, whereas, but a lot of them are. So the Nids one is very much. There's two generic ones, and then there's four detachments, which are these are the units that get buffs, and only those units really interact with this, and then you get a little bit of something for everything else. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Marine ones are a lot more generalist. With the exception of Stormlands and Ironstorm, which really needed to mount it and vehicle, a lot of the rest of them kind of just work with almost anything you're wanting to. Now, the way 10th edition design philosophy is, though, is that so much of the power level of an army is based on its units now. Now, what that mean, what, what I mean by that is you almost decide to use a unit based on it, its data sheet alone. Does it have a good gun? Does it have a good special rule? Does it have a good save? Is it fast? You know, like all that kind of thing. And then you kind of, the detachment level almost like goes on top, goes layers on top of that. But a lot of the time, because things like enhancements, we used to see before we saw like enhancements on last edition, like were relics that were auras and things like that. There's a lot more buff one unit kind of thing. And at the detachment level, that's not, it, it's a thing you consider, but it's not really a thing that outside of specific examples really affects list building. It's a thing mm -hmm. that you kind of, you'll go, okay, I'm playing this attachment because I want this core theme. And then, oh, these are the, the enhancements and I can make I can make that do a kind of thing. There are exceptions in there, like um, specifically the Iron Storm Spearhead with the um, Lethal Hits Aura just changes the way that that dynamic goes. So there are definitely some, some that are in that. But in general, because so much of the power level is invested in the data sheets and the way they interact with the game and your opponent, um, it almost feels like the detachment you pick kind of doesn't matter because mm. the data sheets that are good don't really change unless there's something really specific that drives a data sheet from a detachment, which there just aren't that many of. So the examples I the only real examples I'm like really present of is um Termagants in the Unending Storm detachment, where yeah, you're gonna play Termagants and Gargoyles because that detachment just buffs them. Um uh, Von Ryan's Leapers uh in the Vanguard Evasion detachment where they get advanced charge and the ability to redeploy after the turn roll, so they're a little less um all in. And then you have like the the whirlwinds and redemptors in Iron Storm Spearhead, where they really benefit from like the enhancement suite that you have available there. But those are the only ones that are like really, really push you to a specific kind of list building where it's not just what are the good units? And then pick your last like 500 points based on what the attachment does for you. So like almost every turn of list I expect to see centered, you know, I would be very surprised not to see Biovore, Hive Tyrant, Exocrines, Maliceptors. <laughs> um, and then like, you know, you once you fill out like that kind of six to 1200 point core with the stuff that you like, the rest of that then coming to becomes, well, what does this detachment support? But you're probably still going to have all the same units. You just use them a little differently. And Marines feels the same. Marines lists, it feels like a lot of Marines lists now, now start out with, the apothecary biologists and maybe a land raider redeemer maybe you don't bother with that at all like there's definitely other way to go for that there's mm -hmm. a lot of inceptors a lot of scouts a lot of whirlwinds and then you know if your detachment supports it maybe you'll play redemptor dreadnoughts or maybe you'll play a deathwing knights instead right and it's kind of like what does your what does your melee resilience core look like to go along with your core marine shooting and your marine scoring but the marine scoring the marine shooting doesn't really change it's just what the stuff you're putting in front of that is that that, that gets changed depending on the attachments and like you know, some of the attachments might change the loadout on some stuff. Like, you might go for flamer aggressors in the attachment that buffs flamers instead of bolt aggressors. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to run aggressors in any other attachment, like, you're still running the same unit. They still want a land raider redeemer, right? Because there's no other way to transport them. So if you're going to play aggressors, you're going to play a redeemer because the data sheets are good. That's the thing that's driving you, not yeah. the attachment. And now, then you go into that and you're like, well, why would I not play that in Gladius? Because then I can get bored as well, fire as one as it's called now. Like, and then you get dragged back to playing the same thing that we already did because it's the most flexible and flexibility wins games. Yeah. Um, and, and then you have like an assortment of uh, units that do missions well, and probably those are the same units in any yeah, exactly. still. It almost it almost doesn't matter what detachment you play. If you're playing Tyranids, you're gonna have a couple of Neuroelectors, a Biovor, probably some Rippers, probably some Gargoyles. And then mm -hmm. you know that's like five hundred points of your list. What they commit to that, maybe three to five hundred points, depending on like how you build it. Marines, two by two by two inceptor squads, two scout squads, probably a whirlwind or two, like in almost I would expect in almost every list. Uh, once you start adding in like the te like again non codex compliant stuff like Dark Angels, Blood Angels, it gets a little more diverse. But like in core Marines, that's what you're playing. That's what's mm. good, right? And it doesn't matter what detachment you're playing. Those data sheets, the the reason that you are bringing those data sheets is because of their data sheet abilities. And none of those fundamentally change from detachment to detachment. And they're good because of the weapon profile, because of the data sheet, because of the armor save, because of the movement value. They're not good because they interact with detachment. We don't have enough CP this edition, frankly, mm -hmm. to interact with detachments on that kind of way a lot of yeah. the time. Unless you have some very specific combos like um, free battle tactics or phantasm that just change the way you interact, 
but also like we've never seen Eldar without Phantasm, so we also just don't know how that works, right? So I'll, exactly. I'll back off on that point. But um, there's a lot of you know you just don't get that much. Like enhancements are very low impact almost universally outside of yeah. very specific examples. They're either like a pre-game thing or they buff a unit, which is good, but it's not like build your list around generally. It's yeah. this is a nice to have, not a need to have. Again, specific exceptions apply. Screw you, far screw you, lethal hits aura. Why do you exist? Um, but in general, they're just such low impact that you know you'll pick it based on the detachment rule and then maybe like a strategy or two that's core to your plan. And again, unless you have something like the free battle tactic from the Gravis Captain on um aggressors in the Salamon detachment for free devastating wounds every turn or something like that, where you might you will tweak your plan around that. But you know, the the back ground up rebuilding on that is still only like the last thousand points of the list, the core. Like every list will feel the same because it's using the same units, regardless of what the type you play. And then, and then also, as you said, the uh, amount of command points that you have uh, limits you as well because also that like the generic uh, core rulebook stratagems are pretty good, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, and you're going to spend a lot of your game so. using grenade, command reroll. Um, Overwatch, uh, Overwatch, Ingress, and so Ingress, on. yeah, and then like Marines, Armor Contempt. You're probably Armor Contempting like two turns out of five most games, maybe yeah. more if you're using it in combat. Like, there's only so much space left for you to use some of your detachment stratagems. Yeah. So um, yeah, as you said, if you have a good combo, then probably you can plan for that and save up for that. But but yeah, other than that, uh, you, you probably won't see all six or however many there are used in think, a game. I think Marines falls shorter on that than Tyranids does. Tyranids definitely has a lot more like key stratagems to your game plan like the swarming master strategy being a great mm -hmm. example where you're just going to bank two cp every turn to bring back 20 gargoyles and you're going to bring back eight or gargoyles a game and it's going to be no fantastic pains or something like that yeah. yeah but i mean like the the difference is like you have a defensive strategy that you spam isn't like you know the most groundbreaking um like differential between like synaptic nexus and invasion fleet um mm -hmm. you know you have like it feels like the attachments are just kind of very archetypal you have the movement stratagem the defensive stratagem the two damage stratagems and the weird stratagem and every attachment <laughs> kind of has that and you know sometimes there's like a little bit of your mileage may vary but you know like it is the difference between sustained hits and crit fives for vehicles and devastating wounds on flamers like they both just say this unit that the attachment likes makes thing more dead right it's yeah. not like the most I don't know. The, the 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 flavor in the detachment rules all comes from the, the base ability for me, right? It's the, what is the thing extra that you get? And those are genuinely very different and very cool. And I like them and they have, you know, lots of different ways, but the data sheets have so much base power in them that it almost feels like it doesn't matter what your base rule is. Like if you play Invasion Fleet or, Swar or Synaptic Nexus, for example, you know, you're executing with exploding because against some targets, you're executing with like a five and vulnerable save once per, once per game like both of them kind of like yeah they're cool but they do they matter like they're, they're not the taking that you're taking an extra cream right yeah um it's just a thing you're gonna do so so how would you say does the balance between the detachments within the book work because i was i guess positively surprised when i heard or when i saw that uh, the index detachments were not invalidated by the book so it, it seems that even though for both in both cases the the book came out the original detachment is still very much viable so is the balance like are do you as a as a pro player do you feel encouraged to at least try every single detachment and and see how it does i mean or every single is never going to happen right like there's never going to be a world where i look at every detachment and i'm like i want to try all of these that's just not a thing you know there, there's a there's like at least one stinker in both books i would say culture stampede and anvil strike force just kind of don't encourage the right like the way you want to play 40k right now uh crusher stampede encouraging you to like take damaged monsters like no nah, it doesn't really do anything else and then anvil strike force encouraging you to like stay still and be very stationary like it's just not the way you interact with games of 40k like maybe there's builds in there but there was there was nothing in there that i was like really hyped to explore the rest of them like i think across the board there's definitely it feels like there's kind of partly this is going to be a function of like what the game state looks like right now where the things that it's good to do are the ones that we'll, nat we'll naturally look at when we start reading the codex, right? So right now we're generally looking at you know, a meta where there's a lot of Eldar, which means there's a lot of Wraith Guard. There's also a lot of small, fast units that you want to be able to deal with. So, you know, things like indirect and small scoring units and chaff, and also big hitters that can take out Wraith Guard and Lich Guard and all that kind of thing are the things that are like we are encouraged to look at when we look when we review a codex, right? Because we 
we are looking at it as a as a function of what the game looks like right now. So we we look at the codex and we ask the questions of how does this solve my current problems better than the thing I was playing from the index. And I think for the NIDS codex and the Marine codex, we both kind of we all kind of looked at that and we go, oh, so there's a natural like tier one and tier two in here where these are these are the attachments that have answers for the current problems and these are the attachments that don't and that's a function of time more than anything else and yeah some of it might be power level like one of them has just got more flexibility than the other or vice versa so i would say for like marines it's you know um i would say the salamance attachment and the iron hands attachment both hand both answer the right kinds of questions for right now and then you're talking maybe like stormlands and vanguard have options but are a little unflexible and then gladius is kind of in there as well and then first company and anvil strike force just kind of don't really do what you're looking for so like that kind of gives you like a one two three tier system and then nids you kind of have the same thing you have invasion fleet and synaptic nexus which are both the white bread detachments they do the generic stuff off the data sheets and they support it in a way that is flexible enough that you can get what you want out of them and then maybe like swarming masses or running swarms or whatever the gaunts one is called where that gives you a very new and dynamic way to play the army that um will kill your back but is an option that you can take <laughs> and then we have like assimilation fleet uh, or assimilation swarm and um vanguard invasion that are like kind of on the cusp but they encourage you to use units that can be a little bit weird and they don't like naturally one-to-one -one with the data sheets that you want to play so mm -hmm. they just kind of like they fall into that second tier where it's like i would i would not be surprised to see somebody do well with them but like i would be i wouldn't be like looking for it right and i wouldn't be surprised you know if you were like oh yeah i took the invasion fleet to or i took um assimilation sort of turn at one and four but i thought my list was great i'm like yeah man you took inv you took assimilation your game plan was to heal your malice scepters through damage output and you got shot by 10 wraith guard you weren't healing from that right like does that answer it doesn't answer the kinds of problems that are being asked right now and you have crusher stampede which just sucks um so, that, that, that that's what's great for stratagems and mm -hmm. data sheets it all sucks and you don't get any stratagems this edition so why that was not going to be good so like there's definitely like a one two three of like answers current problems is interesting but doesn't answer current problems as well and is bad or doesn't answer current problems and doesn't like provide flexibility the kind of splits was and th that's not until i'm like power level because i think you know like i think some of them some of those attachments are like 10 out of 10 power level or like 9 out of 10 power level and some of them are like a five or a six but they might be like in you know like both in tier one or both in tier two depending on the situation but like i think in general like that's kind of how we assess attachments right so for me, I immediately went, well, Synaptic Nexus and Vanguard Evasion both seem super interesting, and I don't hate my back enough to play 200 Gargoyles, so let's have a look at them. And I put both of them on the table, and I went back to Invasion Fleet because I like the flexibility that it gives me. And then for Marines, I went, uh, well, what's in here that's better than Gladius? Well, Gladius copped a nerf. It's one of these, it's it, because of the moment changed. So what what was I looking for out of Gladius that I can now get somewhere else? And then that kind of drew, drew me towards Ironstorm because of the general combos of it, and because it asks the right questions into like right now mm -hmm. um so that that's kind of how i how i tried to assess them okay. um of like but in six months time there is entirely is entirely possible that the tool set that that attachment brings you isn't what you need anymore and then we change our minds because as always the meta the meta game is game is a function of what people play and what people think about what people play and mm -hmm. if that perception changes the meta will change to accommodate that yeah so that's that's exactly w w where i was going with my next question so Let's pretend for a second that you know that we have a glass ball that that can tell us the future. Do you think that the way the books that these two books uh, are structured makes them sort of meta proof? And by meta proof, I mean today we have at least two detachments in every book that, as you said, they are the white bread that, that will be picked every single time. But let's say that the meta changes drastically after three, four more books come out. There will do the do these two books do a good job of being viable in six months where the meta switches from using a lot of vehicles to say playing hordes. I think as long as the data sheets that are at the core of these books remain unchanged and mm -hmm. remain reasonably pointed, there is nothing in these books that says that you can't just play a reasonable game with your data sheets that back that supports them in a comfortable way, right? The the books are like the detachments feel like they're i don't know they're like the the i'm going to use it really i'm going to try not to torture a metaphor here the books are the extra bit that's on top of your core army right it mm -hmm. almost feels like you build an army of good data sheets where again you pick your core 12 to 1500 points and you say this is the things that are good in space marines or good in turrets so the detachments are like ready -made the spice, into right? a box and the... then you go 
okay, and which detachment do I want to play with that? And then mm -hmm. that might change a little bit of the, like, you might change the loadout on some units, you might swap in a stratagem, you might change a character for a different character because of that, and then you'll add in, like, your 400, 500 points point of stuff that that detachment supports really well, because there are units that are sort of, like, in the B tier that maybe get bumped to A tier by detachment and stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? You're going to see, like, shifts, not changes. That, that's how yeah. it feels for me. And yeah, they're, they're the spice on top. They're not the... Mm -hmm. And like not the main that's dish. <laughs> fine. It's okay for detachments to be that, right? But there is also like there is definitely power level of difference between the detachments as far as right now goes. Like, you know, you play against Dark Angels with Unforgiven Task Force versus Dark Angels with Gladius, you definitely feel the difference, right? So mm -hmm. And is that something that would change as a function of time? Yeah, maybe. Maybe it turns out that minus, being able to minus two damage or death three knights is great when we suddenly turn into a meta where every incubi is three damage and you two plots. But you know, if that doesn't happen, then we don't have to worry about it. So I, I don't think either of the I don't think either of the codexes will fail as a function of their detachments not being flexible enough. I think that's kind of the, the answer to that question there. Um the detachments have every tool in them for them to remain viable if the units in them remain viable because the units are the differentiating factor of how good an army is right now more than anything else yeah <clears throat> the data sheets are the meat and potatoes and yep the detachments are in the spice so that's yeah. pretty much it yeah if okay. the extra queen didn't exist that's much bigger than if like if you force me at gunpoint to choose between invasion fleet and synaptic nexus or to choose between an extra queen and the next best shooting unit i would i would like you can't convince me i will swap the detachment to crusher stampede before i let you take away my extra queen right that's that's kind of where i'm at with the detachments for marines yeah or for turnits and marines. for turnits yeah uh okay fine so uh, we're not going to rate this because it's 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 really difficult to rate so we'll just move on to the next question where maybe the rating will be uh, a little bit simpler and the next question pertains to i don't know uniqueness of the army i guess or the uniqueness of the mechanics within the army so you said something very interesting in that the original uh detachments that were in the indexes uh, indices um the gladius was actually a more complex one than the tyranids one uh i always thought that the tyranids one is the army that has well, first of all, is it, 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 even today it is an unknown to many players. Like many players look at Tyranids and go like, Ugh, that's very non-standard to what I know. Uh, and then the mechanics as well. So how about the uniqueness of playstyle, uniqueness of mechanics? Which, um, which of the books is more intriguing in okay. that? So I think in terms of detachments, Gladius is the most interestingly designed of all 13 that are available right now gladius is just genuinely a really really cool detachment it has because it has so many layers of interaction between itself right because you have the three once per game doctrines you have a stratagem that lets you recycle them and then you have the three the stratagems that all work that do a base thing but if you're in the doctrine you get the timing right that they do an additional thing and then you have all the enhancements that do a thing and if you're in the right doctrine they do an additional thing right and that all kind of ties together into a like you have a lot of overlapping layers of if you can get your sequencing right and you can do things in the right order gladius like gladius can either be terrible or gladius can sing right like it, there's no there's a lot of in between for a player to like express skill with how they use doctors and yeah sometimes there's simplification but i think gladius is gladius is boring now by virtue of being so played because everybody's putting his space marines 20 times now but gladius itself is actually a super dynamic detachment that has a lot of cool stuff and then every other detachment in the Marine Codex is like pick a thing, you're good at that thing now. Um, which is come which is definitely a come down from Gladys in terms of complexity and, and like interest. Um there's definitely like I don't mean that in terms of like power level, but the storm mounts attachment just says you have a you have advanced charge for the entire game. There's no timing to play around, there's no shenanigans you don't like, but there's also no ability to change how you're playing depending on the situation you can't suddenly have a turn of advance and shoot instead when your opponent was expecting you to advance and charge and you change your game plan you just have advance and charge storm um iron storm is just going to shoot you and it's just going to put dreadnoughts in front of you and say you can't kill these and if you can't kill these i'm going to shoot you more and that's fine but it's less it's definitely less dynamic so i think gladius breeds the comparison down of it's just so much more interesting than every other attachment in this book. It doesn't mean it's stronger, but it but it's like Gladys is like a 10 out of 10 design style wise. Like I think Gladys is fantastic. And the rest of them are somewhere between like a three and a seven. I'm just like, you know, there's cool things in there, but there's definitely like I think um the Firestorm detachment actually is probably Firestorm is probably like an eight. It, that's the one where you have like the transport shenanigans and lots of cool tricks, and like that one can do a bunch of stuff. And the rest of them are like pick a thing, you're really good at that thing, and there's not a ton else to it. Nids, on the other hand, because Invasion Fleet was the, the generic attachment, I think Invasion Fleet is an unknown to people because 
it's underplayed, not because it's like a complicated attachment. It's pick a thing that you're better at killing, and then a bunch of stratagems that are like 80% power level if you're not in synapse and 120% power level if you're in synapse. And they're just like a little bit too good if you have synapse and a little bit weaker if you're not. And like that's fine. Like it's not a complicated mechanic. Are you within six of the brainy things? Cool. Well done. Your stratagems are better, right? It's not complicated. It's just a little bit different. Um, whereas the rest of them are the rest of them kind of maintain that a little bit where like assimilation swarm is, you know, if you're within six of X, uh, X, Y, Z units, you get some healing and there's some stratagems that are a little bit better if you're in range of them or if you use them on them. And synaptic nexus is you get a little bit better if you're in range of your synapse units and the stratagems are, you know, mostly key off of synapse units. And then you have um, crusher stampede, which is your monsters are a little bit better and they get a lot better if they're really damaged and the stratagems work on monsters. And it's just like, it's pick a, pick a type of data sheet and they are better at that. And so, it kind of they all specialize a little further in than invasion fleet does but not in a way that's like unfamiliar to somebody who's played against invasion fleet so like invasion fleet's kind of like the template and the rest of them are like a specialization on that template um rather than uh which i suppose is kind of the same as gladius so like where every detachment takes like an aspect of gladius and makes it more pronounced um but in a much more like close to home way where it still feels like there's lots of options for them so i think nids gets a lot closer to like every detachment feeling like it has a point like, I think some of them, like, I think Assimilation Swarm and Crusher in the current environment are a little underpowered, but that's more of a function of, like, the data sheets that they support not being that great than because the detachment isn't cool. Every single detachment in turn feels like it has a point, except, I would argue, Invasion Fleet and Synaptic Nexus are just the same detachment with different hats on, um, which, fine, cool, I guess. I love having the argument about which one is better. Do you like rural ones and ones, or do you like exploding sixes? Make your, make your decision, right? Like... The, cool and terrifyingly fun um so i think that's a bit of a miss but in general i think it gets a lot closer to having a lot of diversity in mm -hmm. like it pushes you a lot of different directions but like actually pushes you that direction rather than just being like generic data sheets are better here or generic data sheets are better there like you can't pl you could play horde in invasion fleet but you might as well play in um unending swarm because it's just better right but it's better in a way that's different than just being like um you get you get models back because like the um, endless war uh endless swarm has the like recursion from reserve and the movement shenanigans and all that sort of stuff whereas invasion fleet is like bringing models back in the command phase kind of thing for like that's how it supports that's written and feel no pains right so mm -hmm. unending swarm is more like movement shenanigans and recursion whereas um in the uh, like that version in invasion fleet is like resilience and um like a little more like shenanigans with like re regeneration rather than recursion so it's like it's a different approach to the same build and you could build it in either way and it will play differently in both whereas if you try to play advanced and charged off in gladius or advanced and charged off in um stormlands it's just advanced and charged off it doesn't really matter like you'll spend more cp on it in gladius but it's still the same units advanced and charging mm -hmm. and do both books or uh, well are both books comparable when it comes to say access to those game-changing mechanics, like having loan ops, for example, like uh, well, you know, are there? It, it might be a very specific question. Like, is there a comparable amount of data sheets with this? But I mean, uh, no, because partly because Turnit Turnits have like a third of the data sheets that Space Marines do, yeah. right? Like, it feels like you can pick any niche of shooting Space Marine vehicle, and there exists a vehicle that you could want. And Turnits are like, <laughs> do you want a Maliceptor or an Exocrine or a Tyrannifex? And the answer is not Maliceptor or Tyrannifex. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely, and like Marine has the same problem. Like the Whirlwind is the best vehicle in that book. And then like the Redemptor and the Lancer are both pretty good. And so is the Blister Dreadnought. But like they all kind of do similarish things. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of little bit of like, but NIDs have much better access to loan operative. They have, you know, the Biovore, which is a very unique unit. Turnits just have a lot more unique stuff, despite having a lot less data sheets, because they have a much more broad design philosophy, where mm -hmm. you can, it's a lot easier to justify a strange unit in Tyranids, the army that, like, makes units for specific powers, than it is in Space Marines. So I think Tyranids do a lot more with a lot less, but Marines probably, like, there's a lot more flexibility for adapting your army to the meta game in space marines yeah, well, but the you but you like so if you, you can kind of tweak yourself between do i want a ballistas do i want a lancer do i want a redemptor do i want a brutalis or maybe i want the maybe i want to try the planes this weekend like depending on what i'm playing into right that kind of thing where there's a lot of like little scope for te for making those tweaks you kind of like you got like option a or option b in territories right like do you want mm -hmm. do you want to play gargoyles or hormigons or termigons right like there's a little bit of a choice in there but it's not that you don't have the same degree of do I want incursors, infiltrators, assault intercessors, um, eliminators? Like, what do I want my scoring units to be in Space Marines? There's mm -hmm. like 57 options, and you can like micro tailor. Whereas NIDS, it's like there is two very distinct paths, and you get to choose between them. But those paths are a lot more specialized than the Marines ones are. So there's yeah. a lot more. 
it feels like when nits are good, nits are really good. Whereas when Marines are good, they are, it's like because they've built for, they've built with consideration of you. Whereas nits, it feels a lot more like there's, they just kind of like get to be good into certain things and bad into other things because of how specialized their units are in that sense. Mm -hmm. And how about uh, the, the mechanic that GW introduced in this edition? Uh, and are really, it seems at least, that with Tyranids, they're really trying to push for that mechanic to, to, to come into play, which is Battle Shock. Uh, so Tyranids have a, a plethora of tools to actually force battle shots. Um, have you actually experienced that? And you know, have you been on the receiving end or on the what's the the, the opposite serving end? Uh, so has Dealing, battle shock actually? Um, yeah, battle shock one hundred percent comes up. Like there, mm -hmm. I think anybody who even before the change where you the change to insane bravery where you have to now spend it before you do the battle shock like it was last edition um and it's once per game even before that battle shock was a mechanic that definitely came up and i think people people oversold how little it impacted the game mostly mm -hmm. because applying out of sequence battle shock does just not matter right in general which is the which is to say if you have a way to force battle shock during your turn and then going into your opponents, that is usually fairly low impact outside of specific circumstances, like when you're charging into something that might want to interrupt or mm -hmm. use a minus one damage tractor. Like, there's definitely utility to it, but it was generally unreliable enough that you couldn't account for it, which meant that you had to play as if it didn't happen, and then it was a nice benefit when it happened. Yeah, you wouldn't base your strategy yeah. on this. And you mm -hmm. already couldn't, like, insane bravery in that situation. And then, like, the primary side of things was, like, some armies felt it more than others because some armies are very bad at leaving single models alive and they're usually like you know if you're playing a very heavy melee army like you're usually going to like either kill a unit and be stood on an objective or you're going to kill it and be stood on you're going to not kill it but still be on the objective and taking it off them kind of thing right where even if they're below half strength then filling the battle shock doesn't matter so much or you're playing a shooting army that's just leaf blowing people off objectives and there's nothing to stand there anyway so it doesn't matter so like there's definitely situations where battle shock came up before where like you would trigger you would trigger that test and you would fail it and you would like drop five primary but be able to use a stratagem and then nids definitely had more of that because you could do the once per game um double up with shadow in the mm -hmm. warp and things like that where like you felt it a lot more with the changes battle shock is now just like genuinely terrifying every time you go to score primary with a damage unit and there's a lot more it kind of depends how you're playing though right if you're a person that usually just plays to kill units and does plays that for a lot of reliability versus a person who plays like a more risky style where you maybe like try to high roll here try to high roll there you know like maybe this should this only like you do a lot of like this will kill half the time but it won't kill half the time you'll you'll see battle shock a lot more depending on how you approach dealing with units on objectives right that's kind of the beyond shore of all if you're a player that doesn't take that kind of risk and you're like i'm going to put three units into that unit to make sure that it definitely dies you're not going to see battle shock that much right that's just not how that works unless mm -hmm. you're on the receiving end and if you're playing to mitigate that then yeah of course battle shock's not having it it's a mechanic that you can play around you have a, you have your choice of how you want to interact with it you can decide if you're willing to take risk with battle shock or not whether that's in how you approach it whether how you spend cp what units you bring in your army right you you get a lot of agency over it which is cool that's the sign of a good mechanic with the changes now though it's just a thing it's just a thing that's terrifying right you got a you got like a leadership seven model to an objective you lose that objective 44 percent of the time that is not a number that i'm usually very comfortable with yeah. um have you ever seen like like chaos knights for example are great they're oc8 and they're leadership seven which means that 44 percent of the time they will fail a battle shock test and they can only auto pass once a game um you know you don't have to kill them like you can't rely on it but you make them take two battle shocks there's very good odds of failing one of them if you make them take three mm -hmm. they're almost definitely failing one of them nids can force a lot of battle shocks um i think you can get you can do like 20 battle shocks in a turn plus the shadow norp army wide battle shock onto specific units if you really wanted to you'd have to play like a crusher stampede with horror specters and neurolictors and like don't do it but you could make somebody take a lot of battle shocks mm -hmm. um and with the new neural lector, which I mentioned earlier, being like one of the best data sheets, possibly the best data sheet in the book, you now have a bit of additional utility on that battle shock beyond just the um, the no strats and reduced OC. And the neural lectors have an aura of plus one to wound against battle shock targets, which helps a ton with like the fairly poor damage output of turn it's getting over the line, which definitely encourages that army to play even more into that. So things like the neural turn that I definitely wasn't super high on at the start of the edition, I'm much higher on now because it's a good way to just push that army and like get a lot of deliverables about them, deliverables out of them in a way that you couldn't otherwise. So yeah, I think Battle Shock is Battle Shock's a little maligned, but I think that's because people are playing around it well rather than because it's a bad mechanic. It's a mechanic that you know, it feels it would be feels bad if it was, you know, costing you 30 victory points every game. But when it decides instances here and there and affects fights, it's a lot more a lot more fun. And I think they've like Game Shark Trump with the battle insane bravery change did a good job of getting it to that 
uh, and then Tyranids definitely are an army that like lives on the Battleshock. You haven't lived until you've made an entire Tau army take a Battleshock test, uh, going into their turn their turn three when they get Kalyon, and half their army fails it because they're on leadership seven tests, which means they're more likely to fail than not, and they can't spot or guide when they're Battleshocked. Oh, creme de la creme, piece de la resistance. It's fantastic. <laughs> so... It wouldn't. I. I don't think it's correct to say that the, the battle shock. The, so yeah, battle shock as a rule is a tyranny's exclusive rule. Not. Not at all. But definitely, they tap into it more than than other armies yeah, do. Exactly. Now, do space marines have an equivalent? Do they have something like this? A tool that they can also tap into from game to game, pretty reliably. Um, I mean, uh, you consider the grenade strat a tool. <laughs> So like turrets have this one have this one weird trick where they don't get tank shock or grenade because they don't have tanks or grenades, mm -hmm. um, which means they only have nine generic stratagems. So it's always a little bit like it feels like they have to have a little bit more in the tank because they just have less options than everybody else, right? So partly that, but I think marines marines do a better job of being more all rounder than that. There's nothing that they really specifically lean into, and they get a lot more from like if you compare shadow in the warp and synapse, which are both anti battle shock mechanics, to oath of moment, like that's that's the that's the faction level mechanic, right? So Tyranids are a battleship focus faction. Marines are a hit reroll focus. So yeah, Marines have a similar impact on the hit roll step of the mm -hmm. game. I guess that's technically the the approach, but I don't know. Sort it doesn't of, really yeah. mm -hmm. like it's true in like the wrongest sense of the word, where it's true <laughs> but it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Um, Marines are a reliability army, right? Whereas Nids are a little more of the like, can you make your opponent fail something? Can you high roll a little bit? Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot more like lethal hits and sustained hits and all that kind of thing in, in um, Tyranids. Like, you know, can you spike? Can you get, or can you make awkward situations? And the Battleshock feeds into that, right? It's a risk reward mechanic. Whereas Marines is reliability and that's fine. Armies should not, like, I, I got asked a question recently, though, which was, do you think every army should have access to the same tools, whether they're at different power levels? I'm like, no, 100% no. Armies should, the, the, the reason armies are fun and interesting and create interesting game states and bounce off each other in different ways is because you have asymmetric tools. You have to solve problems with the weird scraps that your factions left available to you or find a different way to go through the game without having to solve it, right? Like, Tower are never going to be able to solve, solve the melee problem. So how do you go around solving the melee problem? Mm -hmm. well that that's where the fact that's where faction identity comes from and that's what makes them interesting and that's what makes playing against them different from playing against terrans so it's fine that i don't think marines especially marines being the like the generic everyman faction it, it's fine that they don't have like that same level of identity but it is yeah. reliability right marines are an marines are an army that generally skips the reliability check whereas nids are you know focusing on the battle shot and that's fine it's mm. just different it's just a different approach yeah but it's as, as you said like uh the armies are, are supposed to be different. In a world where chess exists, uh, we don't need another game where everything is absolutely identical. And I actually laughed uh, like two days ago when I was playing uh, uh, Joker, uh, so my co-host from Contact Lost. Uh, we were playing, I don't know, a third or fourth game of me playing Death Guard versus him playing uh, Chaos Knights, which is a very unfavorable matchup for, for Death Guard. And... Uh, uh, I'm also like the most unlucky player in the world, so I had the, the most terrible roles in every of, single of those games, and my opponents usually apologize to me for it. not only their good roles, but also my bad roles. So that, that happened, and Joker said something along the lines, you know what, can you stop playing Death Guard now and just go to Tyranids? They are all about the movement, you don't have to roll anything, so you should be fine. So... I guess that's it. That, that this is what it boils down to. There are there are armies that have completely different playstyles. One is about movement. One is about, as you said, reliability. Another one is about just mathematical output um, or damage output. So, yeah, it's it's a good thing that there is this variety. Uh, but I need to ask about something else. I need to ask about your opinion or your rating of the internal balance of both of the books. Again, we did mention a little bit on that, but does internal balance in those books exist? It's, it's so bad. Mm. I I uh, went through every Marine, every turn of data sheet that had a, like, a reasonable melee profile and couldn't find one that I liked. Just like the entire book. I went through every single thing and there's, there's nothing. There's just, there isn't melee in there. And then I did the same thing with Marines, and they're just like, isn't melee in there? There are no good options for dealing with, like, there are units that are sometimes okay situationally. Like, the Redemptor Dreadnought is not bad in melee. The Norn Assimilator or Tyranid Warriors and Vanguard, like, they're not bad in melee, but, like, they are, 
so significantly like the odds are so significantly stacked against you using melee for reasonable output that you get driven towards the shooting profiles mm -hmm. and then in in tyranids like the Exocrine and the Maliceptor are just better, and the Zone Throat, I guess, in some situations, are just better at shooting than anything else you could run. So why would you run anything besides them? Doesn't matter what attachment you're running, you're probably going to see some number of Exocrines, Maliceptors, and um, Zone Throats. The Biovore and the, the, the generic 20-point Ripper are by far the best scoring options, so why would you see anything besides them? The Gargoyles and the Termagants are both fantastic scoring units with movement shenanigans, depending on situation. Why would you play anything else for your scoring units? There's just the specialization in the Terran Codex has resulted in one option almost always just being better than the other because it just, like, you'll pick the one that's closest to an all rounder or the one that's the most aggressively undercosted in the case of like, the X screen. 135 points for that thing is absurd, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, so you just end up with like a very, like, unless there's a very specific reason for you to do something else very easy answers to the question of what's my shooting unit in, in turn is. and like in the case of melee like you sometimes the answer is just that you're not going to bring any or that you'll bring the one that like the work right, works best for your detachment or that you'll just go without it right and then marines has the exact opposite problem where there are 400 units therefore one of them is the best right now because you know is it right now like I would struggle to put a list on the table that didn't include at least two whirlwinds because mm -hmm. the whirlwind is just the best user of all at the moment because it's indirect with good strength doesn't need a wound reroll that solves most of your problems and if I want resilience well I'm probably going to go for the redemptive dreadnought and if I want scoring well I'm probably going to go with the and I maybe go with the blister dreadnought like depending on the situation if I want raw damage from my shooting well, I'm probably going to go to the blister dreadnought or the gladiator reaper mm -hmm. maybe a repulsor like depending on the situation if I want a, fa a, a good shooting unit that also has some melee, well, there's only aggressors. Nothing else even comes close. If I want answers to problems at range for, like, melt and stuff like that, nothing compares to eradicators, right? There's just, there is a best-in-slot unit in every single slot in Space Marines because there are so many units. And there's also no bloody melee. <laughs> and then you have, like, the scoring suite is going to be Inception Scouts because there is only Inception Scouts. Everything else is just worse at the job. So because Marines are so... Spe are so like unspecialized but every unit is kind of like within its slot there is always a best answer marines will always play the best answer because why would you play anything else there are four other units that are comparable but only one that is the best so you play the one that is the best and then there is maybe some small adjustment depending on exactly what the tactic you're playing and exactly what the meta looks like where like you could argue with me about whether you want to play ballistic dreadnoughts or redemptor dreadnoughts or a lancer and i would listen to you and be like yeah i understand where you're coming from and then I would play Redemptor Dreadnoughts anyway. But if you were trying to tell me that you think the answer is that you should play um, Predators and Vindicators, I'm going to tell you that you're crazy because they are not good data sheets in comparison to the rest. So it just, it isn't, there's always a best answer, right? It feels like, and Marines and Nids both have a very, very strange way of leading you to the same, of you just play the best sheets, and then you kind of figure out the rest of your attachment, the same way we've been speaking. The internal balance on those books is so wildly nuts. The Whirlwind should have gone to Legends, for starters. That data sheet should not exist in the game anymore. Um, and then we can start talking about the rest, but I don't have I don't have an answer for how to fix it. Unfortunately, I'm not a game designer. Better at finding, better at identifying problems than fixing them, sadly. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, that's always easier. Anyway, uh, good. All right. So, it, it, a rating from one to ten on internal ba balance for Tyranids and, and space. Three Marines. on Tyranids, two on Marines. They're both terrible. Wow. wow. Marines is a little bit better. Nids is a little bit better because there are so few data sheets that you sometimes have to pick a bad tool for a problem because it's the only tool available. Marines and uh, Marines also have the Marines is a one if you include um, a, a one on a scale of zero of one to ten if you include non codex chapters like Blood Angels and Dark Angels because you, they're, they're the only way to get melee options, right? So. Hmm. Okay, so a, a crushing review I would say, of the internal balance. Um, so let's get to the to to the most interesting aspect, I guess, of uh, of both of those books, and that is just raw power. So at the LGT, which was I don't know, two weeks ago, um, Tyranids had like a thirty nine percent win rate. Nothing too crazy. But then I think a week earlier, sorry, a week uh, later or two weeks later, we could see uh, John Lennon pretty much go through every single member of the Art of War House. That, and, that uh, was at, uh, that was at the same weekend as uh, LGT. That, okay, all right, even better. Uh, so so like two completely opposite data sets uh, when we when we talk about like stats and and how the book does. Um, I'm not sure about Space Marines. I'm looking at your meta um, 
metadata dashboard. We have says... like half a weekend of data on Space Marines. It's definitely yeah. too early to tell. My immediate thoughts are like Invasion Fleet and Synaptic Nexus and Swarm are somewhere between like a seven and an eight in terms of power level with like LR being 10 and like one being Drakari. So there's like a decent degree of like, I don't know, I wouldn't even put Drakari at one, but like like a meta Drakari build being like a, like a five is probably pretty reasonable. And then you start getting like suboptimal that's below that. Like I would say like six or seven, like six, seven, eight, somewhere in that region for Terran, it's like the best attachments and like somewhere between like three and six for the worst ones. Like a, mm -hmm. I think an optimized crusher stampede detachment is probably somewhere between like a four and a five kind of thing. Um, Marines, I think Iron Storm is going to debut somewhere between eight and 10, depending on like, the situation. I think it's one of the list that has the right tools to deal with Eldar um, and is pretty good into the rest of the meta. Uh, I'm more inclined to be towards like the eight or nine than the 10, but I think it, it's one of the armies that could go into like that sort of power level. I think the Salamanders one could somewhere, is probably somewhere like seven to 10, where I could see it having that kind of upside as well, but I did see it on the table a little bit more, but I have like some faith in that detachment having good answers and good questions for the meta right now. But again, erring more towards the seven or eight than the nine or 10. Uh, and then the rest of them are kind of like, again, in that sort of three to eight space. Gladius and Gladius is probably somewhere around that eight. I think you could probably see like a Vanguard, and like seven or eight Vanguard and Vanguard going somewhere around the same. And then like Anvil Strike Force and things like that being a lot more towards the bottom end. And again, that's in, this is including like non-codex stuff. So Blood Angels, Death Company, um, De Deathwing Knights, um, Dark Shroud, um, Librarian Dreadnoughts, all the kind of things that like solve some of the problems that the Core Marine Codex lacks. You can add a bunch of diversity from the outside detachments, uh, Azrael for Hellblasters, things like that. So there's definitely like more scope in there for like the best version of those lists to be, you know, I think NID Marines are probably like higher ceiling, but NIDs are definitely like, um, NIDs are pretty good. Um, I think the the John Lennon quote I saw recently was, uh, all my day one, and, uh, all my day one games ended me tailing my opponent, and all my day two games ended me hiding an X screen in a ruin and winning by two points. Um, <laughs> Which kind of sums up my feeling on nids. They will punish bad players, but the tools just aren't there to like be a crushing army, and that kind of pushes you into the you got to get like you've got to have some good pairing, some good luck, some good dice, and there's a lot more agency taken away from you in that situation. Where I think I feel like the best marine lists ask questions rather than answering them in quite or, or like are asking questions armies mm -hmm. rather than answering questions armies in the same way that Terrence is. And I think the best armies right now are armies that ask really tough questions of your opponent, like how do you deal with Ten Wraith Guard? How do you deal with Forge Fiends of Chosen? Um, whereas Nits is more like a I'm gonna solve all the questions you're throwing at me and try to score while I'm doing it. Um, and they're one of the best at that, but that playstyle just kind of fundamentally has a bit more of a ceiling for me. Um, and then there's if you're playing teams, uh, Swarm is a 10 out of 10, and you should 100% consider it, but also you 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 will hate yourself. Um, but that list is just genuinely really good in teams. But I think in singles, you run the risk of just, like, clocking out more, much more or, you know, having that chance that you just pull the guy who decided that his 18 aggressors really wanted to get out of the case today uh, and having a bad time. Okay. Uh, when we're talking about, ro like, the, the raw power of the book... Uh... And the next question that comes to my mind is how much or to what extent do both of those books tap into Forge World and Allies? I mean, Tyranids don't, cannot really... Almost not at all. So yeah. Tyranids, I, I have seen some things like the Scythe Hero Duel and the Barbed Hero Duel a little bit, mm -hmm. but just as options, but, but pricey, I don't think right? that they're like, they're pricey, they're a little inflexible, they're, they're cool units, and I don't think they're bad. They're just like they're they're okay and i don't they're not like crowding out space that something else would exist in they kind of go into that like they're in the norn emissary norn Anil assimilator slot where like they're fine you could run them you will probably have a put a bit of a ceiling on yourself um and then i think like the malanthrope doesn't exist anymore sky slashes don't exist so like, there's not a ton of other things in there so not okay. a ton and then marines don't have any marines don't have any data sheets in Fort world they have the astrays and the thunderhawk which are both super heavies so you just okay. won't see them um yeah. they only they only have two um i could and see what an argument to, like Sikaran tank and so on. Hold on. Been Every single one of them is gone. They have two days. Oh, okay. They right. have exactly and only the Thunderhawk and the uh, Astraeus. The Astraeus, I think, is interesting enough in the Iron Ironhead detachment where I would. It's like I, I could see it going four and one. I would not be surprised. But in general, there's there's not a lot of four gold. Um, mm. It's not not really a thing that you're worried that you're having to think about. And then allies like you can run a Kalidus Assassin and Marines would be completely fine with it. Um, other than that, like there are better options, things that use oath better and stuff like that. But the Kalos is pretty good, so mm -hmm. you you will yeah. probably I would not be surprised like to see like a twenty to thirty percent instance rate of the Kalos assassin in Marines or maybe the Avarsar like situationally. But 
not a not like you're not going to see like imperial knights showing up in them because you would rather run something that can use oath or can use armor contempt. I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're we'll we're, we'll continue talking about the raw power because um like how would you rate and again we probably mentioned this already uh, to an extent but how would you rate the power of each of the books individually into the current meta? So like how well do Tyranids fare and do they need like a really skilled pilot to actually do well? Um, oh, oh, at the LGT, as I said, 39% win rate, but also I haven't seen any big names or at least correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't seen any of the top players actually picking Tyranids. So maybe that also explains the win rate a little bit. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think, like mm -hmm. I said, Marines Marines are somewhere between 7 and 10, depending on the like exactly how they debut and how the meta like reconciles around them existing. Because I think once you start seeing things like Redemptive Dreadnought, World 1 car park showing up a bunch more, you start asking, like, how do I deal with this? And then, like, we'll see where they land after the meta goes through a cycle of having to encounter that. Nids have kind of entered, wet, farted, and left. Like, we've seen Nids come in. Nids are completely fine they are a power they were an army that has a power level somewhere in the region of can win a tournament and there is nothing wrong with that but they are not going they are not the next eldar they are not better than votan or tau or anything like that they are just an army that is in the game right now uh, somewhere in that sort of like eighth to tenth spot or, or eighth to twelfth like you would respect them if you paired them but like you're not sweating buckets at pulling the young karn and ten wraith guard uh it's just not not the same camp power level so seven or eight but you know a skill pilot can take them could take them as far as they want a skill pilot can apparently take sisters all the way to a super major one super major right. range so like i'm not going to sit here and say you can't win a tournament with uh terrorists because lennon keeps doing it so there's nothing wrong with that yeah so so again that was like the last question that i wanted to ask in this segment in this first section yeah how how much are those books dependent on good pilots i guess you sort of uh answered that already uh but this will bring me back to one of the questions that I already asked. Uh, I think it was the second one when I when I asked whether the armies are beginner friendly. And uh, when the when the Tyranids book came out, uh, I was talking to Pumba because I was like on um, on the fence whether I should be playing Death Guard and Tyranids. And uh, we were discussing Tyranids, and I said, "Well, the, the Vanguard onslaught or whatever it's called looks looks pretty interesting. I could tap into that." And Pumba said, "Yeah, but you need to realize that it's a very difficult that one to play, uh, and it really punishes uh, mistakes. So maybe not the safest choice uh, for yeah, someone like that, you." Yeah, I think that specific detachment definitely has a bit of that detachment is playing a bunch of really fragile strength five AP one melee and trying to control board states and. Mm -hmm like punish your opponent for extension and pin them in the deployment zone it's more like an orc wall list that deploys nine inches away from you than anything else it's not really trying to do damage to you it'll bring like some sources of it to remove problems but in general it's a choke your opponent army so that that army yeah for sure but i think in terms of like beginner like if you just put that on the table and we're like i'm gonna advance and charge a bunch of people you know if you're playing against other people of that kind of quality it's gonna be fine uh, i think if you're going from the if you were to write up a run if i was to like almost randomly pull 2,000 points of data sheets out of the codex and take it to a tournament, I think they both suck, right? So I don't think there's a there's a meaningful metric in there. Um, but again, Marines will always be less punishing to play because in general, the saves are better and there's more get out of jail free mechanics. So I think yeah. that's, I, I stand by my like, nids are, nids are more beginner friendly uh, or less beginner friendly just because of the way the faction is like the, the fragility and the like general lack of damage output whereas marines like at the end of the day worst comes to worst you're still also momenting people so as long as you brought something that resembles damage output you can solve some number of problems which will win you some number of games mm -hmm. all right whereas if you try to control the board as terran is and you get it wrong your army just dies all right so the final question of the summary and then uh, we will conclude that section which one of the two are you more likely to play and why Oh, that's tough. Um, you know the I, answer. <laughs> I have played Space Marines at a tournament. I have not yet played Tyranids. And Tyranids came out like a month and a half before Space Marines. If that tells you anything, it's that the Marine Codex is a lot quicker to put on the table, doesn't require as much sort of like pre-preparation in terms of not even brain power. Like it doesn't require as much 
like meta tailoring to like really nail in the specifics. You just get to solve some problems with Oath of Moment Whirlwinds and Redemptor Dreadnoughts. That's what I put on the table. And it was fine. And it was also the most boring three games of Warhammer I've played in a long time. Um, whereas Tyranids, I put it on the table and like it was, you know, you were like it was like walking uphill with one hand tied behind your back and also to your ankle at the same time, where it just felt like you were working so hard for mm-hmm. every single point, but the, the points were all available if you want, if you were like really willing to get them, but it was on you to make it happen. Um, I think if I was like absent of any like performance related goals, I would prefer to play the current Marine Codex with something like Blood Angels because there's a lot of it doesn't feel like I'm having to work as hard for anything, but in terms of like general level of enjoyment, I think the NIDS Codex has a lot of like scammy high roll potential and cool things you can do, which is a lot more interesting. But like honestly, probably Marines of the two, um, which feels weird. I feel like I, I want to say Tyranids, but the Tyranids book just doesn't. I don't enjoy low damage output factions. I think that's kind of my um, general feeling on it. I don't mm-hmm. like feeling like I can't solve a problem by. At least, kind of applying damage. Like, I, I, something hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, like, and NIDS, it just feels like you have to put, you know, you have to spend 2,000 points to solve 200 points of problems. Every yeah, it's turn. more like a death by a thousand cuts than hitting yeah, someone exactly. with a hammer. Mm-hmm. You're never, you know, you can never commit, you know, like one X screen doesn't kill anything. Three X, two X screens, it's like, I don't know, one X screen is none, two is one, and three is two kind of thing, <laughs> where like you need to fire at least two X screens at any target to be able to reliably justify spending the investment. And there's a hard limit toughness 10 and the same thing and marines kind of has the same thing but marines you at least like you have all the moment and you can solve problems you have grenade strat and i grenade strat and tank shock are like the way you solve a lot of problems this edition things like the avatar things like um like celeste or anything like that yeah yeah, the incarn um anything that's just like a problem that you need solved having access to the double mortar wound out of phase gives you more answers for that and i generally prefer that and then once you add in the non-codex chapters on top of that, specifically, again, like I said, Death Company, Deathwing Knights, um, Librarian Dreadnought, um, Thunderwolf Cavalry for Stormlance, there's just a lot more a lot more out there to make an army that plays the way I want it to than there is in NIDS, which is a shame because I love the NIDS. It's just the power level feels a little off right now where it feels like I'm... It feels like I'm running just like a little bit too little stuff, right? If the yeah. if the points changes that came out with the codex hadn't come out and everything was just like 10 points cheaper across the board and you just played with an extra 200 points of nits, I feel like I would be having a I would be having a great time with that codex because it would be more like the Votan camp of it just gets so much stuff that it doesn't matter that it doesn't do that much. But it's not, so we work with what we've got, which is less stuff. Mm-hmm. I know I said that it was supposed to be the last question, but a- another one just popped into my head and I feel it's important, so I'm going to ask it as well. Um, I Maybe I, I won't formulate the question like which one is better than the other, but I'll ask about the overall viability and usefulness of both of those books in teams. So do They're you think great. that... They're both great. Okay. 100%. They both have... Teams also has the thing where like hyper-specialized lists do a lot better in teams because you can just avoid the answers yeah. or you can use them to create problems. And NIDs are very good because their units are so hyper-specialized at creating very specific lists that do a thing very well and using that to body pairings. And Space Marines have so many data sheets and so many resources that you can build a Marines list that kind of asks any question you want to do or solves any problem you want to do, both of which are very powerful tools to have in pairings. And I would definitely have them both like, once you cover like the core bases of Eldar, Chaos Space Marines, probably Tau and Votan, like, and Chaos Knights. Like, once you're past that and you're talking into, like, the last three slots, you know, I could see subbing in Marines or Nids for any, like, any one of Tau, Votan, CK, and maybe two of them, and then in, like, five mans, and then, like, in sixes and eights, like, it becomes very easy to add the add them in, in like, your last three mm-hmm. slots, and, like, be comfortable with them being a thing that you can use to answer problems or create problems. So, yeah, I think in teams, they're both great. All right. Fantastic. I think we will we will stop here when it comes to this part. So we will end part one here, and uh, in a moment we will move on to part two. So part two is going to be the Tyranid Masterclass. We're going to try and pack a lot of information in a limited yep. time. Just said here. I don't want to play Tyranid anymore. Let's go to my Masterclass. <laughs> Let's go to the Masterclass, yeah. Not the best advertisement, but still, uh, to those players who are very much Tyranid-oriented or want to learn something about them, how to tackle them, because there are still many people who don't really understand how the Tyranids work. Uh, then the masterclass is definitely for you. Uh, we in, uh, well, I invite you um, cordially to uh, to our patron 
uh, to get the early, ac early access to that. And uh, yeah, Ines, uh, it's been great to have that conversation with you and uh, looking forward to the masterclass in a moment. Thank you so thank much you. for having me, Tomek. Uh, and to everyone else, uh, thank you. Uh, make sure that you subscribe, like, leave uh, a comment uh, so that it helps us grow, helps us reach bigger audiences and so on. We will be much obliged. And then the Patreon page is also there with some nice merch, some beautiful, beautiful dice, uh, t-shirts and stuff. So uh, if Ines' content doesn't convince you, maybe the merch will. Uh, I've got some of the dice, they roll really broken. Um... Sorry, true. they were ones all the time, something like that. Uh, Not true. I had a plenty of sixes when I played you. It yes, just you did. A, dis a disgusting yeah, the, number, in fact. <laughs> unfortunately, you know, the dice didn't help. The skill was lackluster. So, yeah, but anyway, moving on to part two. Thank you, everyone. Until next time. Bye-bye.